I'm Miss Emma, the Reading Whisperer. This is one of the resources that I've shared on the Facebook page, Speech Sound Picks. Just download the PDF and print it all off. This is to introduce the SSP monsters for monster spelling for the green code level. On the green code level, we're focusing on six speech sounds. The speech sounds are s, a, t, p, e, n. If you already know something about linguistics, you'll know that above the speech sound monster, his thinking inside his thinking bubble is the phonetic symbol for his speech sound. But don't worry about that. You don't need to learn them. You don't need to know about them. But they will all become apparent as to why it's actually important that you know what they represent. So get out your laminator and all I've done is I've just trimmed them and I'm going to laminate two to an A4 sheet. So when you print them off, you just fold it over. So you print it off as an A4 sheet and it's like that. Fold it over and then just trim it. I just trim down that side, that side and that side and then laminate and then you've got the cards for the um, monsters that love what will be the green level sound picks. Now you don't need to read the research about the importance of phonemic awareness but if you do go to big6reading.org. Explicit instruction in phonemic awareness is one of the most important things you can do to prevent reading and spelling difficulties. It actually wires the brain for reading and spelling. And also make note that the recommendations that it is a systematic phonics instruction, no mention of limiting you to a type of phonics, for example, synthetic. As an educator, my primary focus is on, are the students happy? Are they thriving? Is it a child-centered learning environment? Are we fostering a love of learning and excitement and a curiosity? Therefore, a lot of the commercial phonics programs that are around scare the heck out of me. Within SSP, the phonics element is actually called code mapping. We're mapping the speech sounds with the pictures of the speech sounds. So we're mapping the code. We're linking everything so it's meaningful and purposeful. And although we do explicitly teach the code, everything is in meaningful context. We're developing fluency and comprehension from day one, day one of learning the code. Before we start learning the code, we're actually developing phonemic awareness. The phonemic awareness we develop with no link to phonics, no link to the letters at all. And this is something I'm finding is really lacking in a lot of the commercial programs, phonics programs, especially synthetic phonics programs. They go straight into phonics. But if children don't have phonemic awareness, the phonics will make little sense. By the end of their first prep year, you'll still have three or four students who have absolutely no idea of how to link the speech sounds to the letters, to the code mapping, because they can't hear the speech sounds. And some of them completely mislead educators by talking about syllables and onset and rhyme and blends and what have you. That's not phonemic awareness. That's phonological awareness. It's the phonemic awareness that counts. Phonemic awareness relates to the smallest units of speech sounds. So it means that you're thinking, when does my mouth move? When does my tongue move? When's there a new speech sound? So if I say a word like box, phonemic awareness means that you can identify that there are four separate speech sounds. B, O, K, S. And that matters. How many speech sounds can you hear when you say the word penguin? Look in a mirror, listen, feel your mouth. P -e -g -w -in. Penguin. Think about when you add a tiny little sound when you're actually splitting those speech sounds because you're not blending them all together. When I said w, I actually went w with a little bit of an extra sound there. I added an uh, and that's what we do when we segment. But the children need to know that, that it's actually not always going to be exactly the same as when we say it, because when we say it, we say it so quickly. But all of these things need exploring. You're not really teaching them anything, and the children are talking. And if they're not articulating well, this helps this as well. But what we're doing is we're starting from what the children are already doing, which is speaking, and thinking about how we say words, thinking about those speech sounds. 
What's happening in the brains whilst you're doing that is really remarkable. It's an amazing early intervention. Think about when you say cow. The beginning of the speech sound, the beginning of the phoneme is different than when we end it. The last part of it sounds like one of the speech sounds we used in the word penguin. The w speech sound. Cow. But think of the first part, the ah. Uh, we have to close that. We can't walk around with the ah uh, sound. It's not finished. We use the w to finish it off. So even though we've might made two slight changes, it's still the smallest unit. In SSP, duck hands represent are used to show the smallest speech sound units. Duck hands are also really important for the brain. If you don't have an SSP puppet, use your hand. Use your hand for the duck hands to go left to right. You're speaking in speech sounds, but your brain is acknowledging those individual speech sounds and the order in which they are placed, ready for when we talk on paper, ready for when we code map, ready for the phonics part. K, ow, cow. Students do it from their left to right. The educator will do it from their right to left because they're mirroring. They want the students to still see it from left to right. A child who can speak in speech sounds has a brain wired for literacy. You have a go at saying my friend is a frog in speech sounds. Use your duck hands from left to right. Think of these three words. A T story and monster. How many speech sounds do you use when you say those three words? A T story monster. So think about how many speech sound lines you would need. We put the numbers to help the brain again recognize that we're going from left to right. So which is the one for a t? Which is the one for story? And which is the one for monster? This is also why the phonemic awareness work is so useful for adults. Adults might think of the word a t as e i g h t y. Six letters. But there aren't six speech sounds when we say the word 80. And that's because in English, our speech sounds don't map one to one with the letters. There are only 26 letters, about 46 speech sounds, and about 200 pictures of speech sounds used to represent every single word in the English language. If you can hear those speech sounds, then the wonderful thing about SSP is that you will then be able to code map those speech sounds with a letter or string of letters so that every speech sound is used, every letter is used, nothing is left over. Students like that. It's neat, it's organised. Every speech sound code maps with every letter or string of letters. We call them the speech sound picks. What happens to confuse a lot of students is when people start talking about splitting words into different parts of speech sounds like blends or onset and rhyme or syllables. A child who uses SSP can tell you how many syllables there are, onset and rhyme, whatever you want them to do, because their phonemic awareness is so good. But what we want to do is keep it very simple for every student. So think about the purest, smallest parts of our speech and how they map. If you start saying things like frog or what have you, it confuses a lot of brains because they're putting the fur as kind of like one speech sound. And it's not. It's two speech sounds. It's a f blended with a r. So we're teaching them to hear those individual speech sounds and to blend any speech sounds that they can hear. So they know how to blend. You don't need to blend anything for them. Let's keep it very, very simple. So hopefully by now you've realised that 80 has three speech sounds. Story 
has five speech sounds and monster has six speech sounds. If you're not sure, it's because your brain has probably been confused by phonics. Phonics that actually is very confusing to a lot of kids. So if you're sitting there wondering, then contact me so that you can see why they're code mapped with the speech sounds and the sound picks as simply as that. If you're confused, the students are going to get confused. Now, it's really important that you can actually see that every child's brain is operating effectively. So it really is code mapping the speech sounds with the sound picks effectively, which means you need to know if they can actually identify those speech sounds. And that's why we use duck hands, lines, numbers, we play the word. And now we've got the new SSP monsters, which are going to make it even easier for you to make sure you don't fail any student. And if you've got older students, we can quickly get them on track. Because before they start thinking about the letters, the writing, we need to wire their brains for phonemic awareness. We've known this for years. I'm not saying anything new at all. For some reason, though, the message about the importance of phonemic awareness has got a little bit lost. And I think part of that is this push for synthetic phonics, because most synthetic phonics programs do not start with phonemic awareness. The programs ask you to teach letter sounds with letters from day one. We're going to fail a lot of kids if we keep doing that. So let's change it. So let's look at this resource I've given you. So I'm just laminating these. These are already done. I'm going to cut them up. And these will be sold as, pack, as, as cards, so not as big as this. But these will be sold as cards so you can actually have every speech sound so that's the explicit teaching, that's in the four code levels. So we learn the, the high frequency sound picks. Um, here are all the other sound picks. We don't cover all of those in the four in the explicit teaching because of the, there are 26 letters, about 40, 46 speech sounds, um, phonemes, but there are about 200 pictures to represent all the speech sounds. So we couldn't possibly cover the, all of those. There would be no point, so we cover the high frequency ones. So these are the high frequency ones that you see here. So in the green code level, they look at this one. They listen for the monster it says, and we listen and we take a picture. What might it look like? It might look like that, but it might look like that. So the children need to have all of the choices, but in a way that they understand. It needs to be um, in the way that a five, a four or five-year-old understands, not in a way that a child understands if they know what a vowel sound is. Okay, now if you're working in prep or the early years, get a surface that they can write on that's a really big surface. Um, get something they can write on. So like if I was to do the word sat, then we would think duck hands first, don't we? S -a -t sat. Then they do the lines or you help them if they can't yet hold pencils and what have you. So sat. You might put the cards for the one, two, three underneath or help them. All depends on the child. S -a -t S -a -t. So we're building, code mapping, the word sat, at, and I talk about playing the speech sound piano, at, sat. So now we're not even thinking about phonics, we're not even bothered about the letters or whatever that are to go and to go on there. We need to first know, right, we've got, I like to lay them out in the order that we actually do the, to cover the code explicitly. So we've got at, p, i, n. So it also helps the children remember sat pin sat put in okay so if we've got sat at sat so which monster which monster do we use to sit on here we need the monster so we put him on here now i know that looks like an s but that's the phonetic symbol ignore that and the children you don't even need to talk with them say what's that we say it's actually the picture that means it could be any pictures for that speech sound it's the generic picture even though when you then look at the first picture that we look at in the code level, it looks like this and they'll say, oh, it looks the same. We say, yes, it does. But actually it's funny because this one means it could be any picture for 
It could be any of the pictures in here. But yes, it's kind of a bit of a hint, isn't it? So we've got s So, and all of this is about segmenting. It's about the ordering of the speech sounds. And this is pure phonemic awareness. And it's going to help with the articulation. So s a t which is monster a a t p it n Here's monster a. So again, what's the order? So we're building words. If I was to look at a word in the air, sat, the sounds are like this, sat, if I'm going to then translate it onto paper. So we want the children to think left to right, s a, what goes here, t, s a t, sat. We've built our word sat, monster spelling, s a t, sat. Now this part is what wires the brain for reading and spelling. If you do this in preschool, even if you never put a letter on here, you're wiring those brains so that every child will go into school and not fail. We know that phonemic awareness is the biggest predictor of reading and spelling success and failure that there is out of everything. Over intelligence, where they live, parental involvement, over everything. So phonemic awareness matters and that is the ability to hear in the sounds, those speech sounds, know the order. We can also tackle manipulation, which is the highest level of phonemic awareness. Manipulation means, if I was to take away the A and change it for an I, what's the new word? Now you want them to be able to do it, oh gosh I'm wrinkling, you want them to be able to do it by listening, sat, s, at, I'm going to change the A, the number two sounds for an I, what's the new word, s, it, but here, imagine how great it is when they can visually see it, s, at, we're changing the A into an I, what's the new word? So we're doing early phony manipulation. I, t, sit. Oh, the new word sit. Now, when I did that and I went s, it, we're following the sounds. That's what we say in SSP. Follow the sounds, say the word. S, it, sit. And that's blending. Again, another vital skill. So all of the skills the children need, we're using, we're doing without even bothering about the visual distraction, because it can be a visual distraction, of the pictures of the sounds. Ah, uh, I just like to put them back in order. T, p, I, n. And the children like to get organised as well. Now, a lot of children are ready for the phonics very, very quickly. So I'll say, well, we had s, it, so I've moved them now, but we'd say, right, so the monster, s, when you take a picture of s, and you just use your magic speech sound camera. So you just use your imagination, close your eyes and use your camera, which is again multi-sensory and fun. And why we call them pictures of speech sounds, the speech sound pics, listen for the speech, translate it into pictures of the speech sounds. What's it going to look like? What's the picture going to look like of s in this word? Who decides which it is? The king. He records it all in the code mapping book, which is called the dictionary. The dictionary will show us how every word is spelt. We can't change that, so we have to think how do our speech sounds map with the letters in the word, code mapping. And it often changes depending on our accents. So we also think about whether it's an accent, that's why the speech sounds have changed, or whether we're being a little bit sloppy. And the speech sound king says, please be careful about how you speak so the speech sounds are correct. For code mapping. And of course the children love the speech sound king puppet, especially because he's got his stick, which means that he can point to the words and he can follow the sound, say the word, within speedy pair decoding. So the picture for the speech sound here looks like this. What's the picture for I here? It looks like this. What's the picture for Do we do sit or sat? We changed it into sit, didn't we? <laughs> I need help with my working memory. S it. What's the picture for t that goes here? So we've built, we've actually used monster spelling to spell the word sit in preschool, listening for s it. We know where the speech sounds sit. We've blended them into the word. We've followed the sounds to say the word. And now we've thought about the picture of the speech sound, s it, and we've built the word. And that is what will wire every brain in your preschool class for reading and spelling. And they love it. And I love these because look, that's so cool. We can use this massive great space. I've got glass on mine. 
but you don't have to use glass obviously regulations but you can use perspex or whatever but i love it we start again and the children do it themselves this lovely big space when they're in prep they start using little whiteboards but they're little so get this big space really make it fun big exciting don't limit them now with the activity that i've shared with the pdf i've given you something to print that's just got three speech down lines on so we're keeping it nice and organized we're limiting it to words that just have those three speech sounds so they're thinking about words like sat, sit, tin, tan, ant. So think of lots and lots that they can do. That's why we choose sat pin. That's why we choose sat, put it, and to start off with. A lot of programs use that, and it's purely and simply because we can create so many words using those speech sounds. These are what we call the SSP Green Visual Prompts. It's a picture, and there's an associated word. And that word can be created orally and in print using the speech sounds s at put it in. they can look at the visual prompt this is the one for spit duck hands s p it spit lines s p it spit sound pics s p it spit spit then they could write it s p it spit so they can learn to encode that spell, decode, that's one part of reading, we just also need the fluency and comprehension, just using this group. So to start off with, we're not focusing on recognising lots of uh, sound picks. To start off with, we're, we're focusing on using them. For fluency, we do things like the SSP wraps. Here's the green cone level one. You have to see if you can do it in 14 seconds or less. Sat, pat, tam, pan, tim, pin, ants, nan, pan, nip, sip, tip, pit, ants, nap, sap, tap, tip, nip, pit, ants, Pat has lots of ants in his pants. They have to decode sentences at their code level. And not just decode it, but also explain which is the correct one. The speech sound frog might have eaten some full stops or capital letters or what have you. They've got to explain, they've got to justify, so verbal intelligence, why a certain sentence is correct. So that's not just your fluency, it's critically analysing. It's actually developing higher order thinking, even from the first code level. We're using technology. Download the free SSP Spelling Piano app for iPads. If you can't find the link, just contact me. But that's helping with their spelling. But they're able to get on with it on their own. And again, it's around fun and enjoyment. People can get a little bit confused over decodable readers. I call them code mapping readers. Every book is decodable if the child knows the sound picks in that book. But if they don't, it's not decodable. So what we look at in decodable readers is not how many words there are, what have you. It's do the children know the code in that reader? If they do, there's no surprises. They're just reinforcing code knowledge. They're reinforcing the skills and concepts that underlie reading with fluency and comprehension. So we're using a range of decodable readers. And I also write my own because I tend to find that some of them can be a little bit um, stilted or a little bit boring, perhaps, for some of the kids. So I try and make it as interesting as possible because we want the kids reading for pleasure. You can see Stan here. He's actually one of our visual prompts. They look at him and they think of the word Stan. St -a -n Stan. But he also features in some of my new code mapping readers.
so it's all meaningful and it makes sense to the kids. Think of so many of the things that we often say to kids without realising how many skills and concepts they need to even understand what on earth you're talking about. A for apple. What does that mean? A is a speech sound. And most adults aren't aware of the speech sounds in their spoken words. Because our spoken words, it's fairly natural, it's fairly easy to learn. We don't start speaking in speech sounds, which is actually why children using SSP in the early years do start doing that. But a for apple, what the adult means is, a is a speech sound. When I say the word apple, a is the first speech sound, a, p, all, there are three speech sounds. So a is the first speech sound in that word apple. Now if I wanted a child to understand that concept, I would actually get them to close their eyes and to listen for the speech sounds in the word apple, a, p, all. As you'll know now, there are sp three speech sounds, three speech sound lines. A, P, U. And we'd play it. Where does the A sit? It sits on the first line, on number one speech sound line. But the problem is, most adults then show them the word apple. They haven't yet even understood that a P, the letter P, that's just his name, is one of the pictures for P. Let alone that when you put two P's together, there's still, the same P, there's still a picture for the same speech sound. They haven't looked at an L for the picture for all, let alone an LE. They've not even looked at an E yet. That's just the letter name. I'm saying that so you know which I'm talking about. But for them to look at the word apple and you say A for apple, yes, the A, they can see visual discrimination. They can see it's at the beginning of that word. None of the rest of the word actually makes any sense to them. And we're presuming that they can actually hear that A ah when we say the word apple. And children with poor phonemic awareness can't even hear that A ah is a speech sound in the word when we say apple. Now the research tells us that's between 10 and 35% of all your children that start in a kindergarten class. It doesn't matter what brilliant oral language experiences they've had or their parents have rhymed and read to them, whatever. Unless you do specific things, between 10 and 35 odd percent of children are going to come in with poor phonemic awareness. And it doesn't matter how clever they are, they're not going to crack the code. Not until you overcome it. And this is also the same as s for snake. Yes, s is a speech sound at the beginning of the word snake. But then you start talking about snakes and snakes saying s, which not all snakes do actually say s. But we're, set, we're, we're giving the children so many concepts to think about and we're presuming that they're going to take away from that the things that we're trying to teach them. I've often gone into a class and people will say, oh, the children know their letter sounds. And they might look at an S and they might go, Shh, and they might even show an action of a snake hissing or whatever. But then when I actually ask them to use that or um, in a word or in a real context, they have no idea what they're talking about. The funniest thing is when they do k and they do these, <laughs> they do these funny castanet um, sort of actions or whatever. And I say to the children, what's a castanet? And they say, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so like think also things like um, C when you're using the letter name instead of the speech sound. C says K. You're presuming the child understands that the letter C, let's say they know the letter names, the letter C represents the speech sound K because um, a letter doesn't make a sound. It's a, what letters do are they're representations. They, they represent our speech sounds. But when you say things like C says K, what happens then when you give them a word like um, cent, like um, C-E-N-T, like 10 cents or whatever? The same as when I see children with um, looking at an S and saying S. Well, what are they going to do when they come to the word sugar? They're going to be really actually quite cross because they, it won't make sense. And they'll start to think it's their fault. But actually, it's not. It's because the code has been set up in such a confusing way to start off with. What sound does this letter make? Well, letters don't make sounds, especially if you've got children who are very young. They're very, very um, literal. So if you say, what sound does the cow make? He'll say, they'll say, moo. When you say, what sound does this letter make to a child? How does that make any sense whatsoever? The letter is just a squiggle on a piece of paper. It doesn't make a sound. 
So that's why in SSP we're, we're making sure the skills and concepts are very obvious. We're listening for those speech sounds. If I close my eyes and I take a picture of that speech sound with a magic speech sound camera, what might it look like? And we say, what might it look like? Because in a different word, it might look like something else. So when it does look like something else, in another word, the children aren't surprised. It's a long E. It's a long A. Again, think about a four or five year old. And let's face it, I would rather children learn to read and spell before they even start school. So let's say that these are four year olds. What is a long E? Now I look at a giraffe and I'll say that's got a long neck. They can see he's got a long neck. So they can understand the concept of long. But what's a long E? Silent letters are the most ridiculous concept ever. And we wonder why so many get really quite annoyed with phonics and don't want to use phonics. We have to use phonics. We have to teach children the links between speech sounds and sound picks. But it has to be in a way that makes sense for every single word in the English language. Don't make it make sense. It must make sense. It's a silent letter. There's no such a thing as a silent letter. A letter, first of all, I say, is just a squiggle. So it's not silent and it's not loud. It's not bossy. It's not magic. It's nothing. It's just a letter. It's just a squiggle on a piece of paper. And when you look at the 26 letters, we can use them in different combinations to represent our speech sounds so that we can talk on paper. But there's no such thing as a silent letter. Every speech sound is used. Every letter is used. So if you've got the word like house, <sighs> Ow, three speech sounds. That last one, the last speech sound, how is it represented? If we took a picture of the in the word house, how is it represented? It's represented with the S E. There's nothing silent about it. So SSP is suitable for children who have no prior knowledge whatsoever. Three year olds. Now I've got these monsters out because we can build green code level words if you're on the green code level. These monsters love the green code level because they love the speech sounds in the green code level. They love s at put it and let me think. So who loves s? He does. Monster s. Who loves a? does because it's monster ah who loves t he does because it's monster t who loves p he does it's monster p who loves i who loves the speech sound i she does, because she's monster i. And who are we missing? S at put it n. Here's monster n. And that means we can build, we can use the monsters to build all the green code level words. But they're more important than that because they are the speech sound. So it's not just one of them, like the s. He doesn't just love this picture for his speech sound he loves lots of them look these are all the sound picks that he loves just here oh, that must be his brother because he's yellow he looks the same doesn't he but he's yellow so what about this one he doesn't just love a ah, that looks like the picture of at ah, that looks like that there are three of them he loves on there one, two, three. And the P monster, monster P. He doesn't just love this one that we look at in the green code level. He loves all of the pictures for P. And what about T? He doesn't just love the picture for T that we look at in the green code level. He loves all of them. He doesn't just love the picture for N that we look at in the green code level. He loves all of them. Look at them all. And they're examples of words that you can find them in, in the dictionary. So what have we missed out? We've got S, A, T, P. I think we're missing I. 
This is the picture for it that we look at in the green code level. So this monster here, Monster I, she loves that one. But she also loves all her other ones. Look at all her other ones in there. So I've just got the six out here. But look what's so fantastic. Even if you don't know all of the sound picks, because there are 26 letters, but there are a lot of sound picks. You can still spell any word, and it doesn't matter what the word is. It could be a gigantic word. Let's use the word gigantic. G, I, G, A, N, T, I, K. Gigantic. Let's do the speech sound lines. G, I, G, A, N, T, I, K. Gigantic. Can you do it whilst you do the numbers? That's what's really, really tricky. G I G A N T I K. Gigantic. It's a gigantic word. So it doesn't even matter if you're on the green code level because we're thinking about listening for the speech sounds. So which monster goes on there? Monster J. Which monster goes on there? J I. Which monster goes on here? J I G. J I G. Who goes on here? J I G A. Gigantic. So we've got a J monster J, monster I, monster G, monster A. Gigan monster n monster t i and k j i g a n t i k and you can just put the monsters on there j i g a n t i gigantic you can think about what happens if one disappears and you've got to work out which is the speech sound that's gone which one was it j i g a n t it's the t monster t that's gone what about this one j i it's monster i that's disappeared just get little pictures of the monsters and you just put the monsters on there. And then you could say to somebody, well, on the J one, I think it might be this one. This might be the picture for J that you think it is. And then your teacher or might, whatever might say, no, it's not that J. It is J. You're spot on. It is J. Monster J needs to sit there. But it's not that one. And they'll show you which one it is. But you can start off, if you're not sure which is the sound pick, you can just put the monster on there. And then your teacher or your parent or whoever knows that you know the right sounds that go on these lines. If you put monster J, I, G, A, N, T, I, K, your teacher knows you're hearing those sounds brilliantly. Even if you don't yet know which are the pictures that go on those lines. That's what's so fantastic about monster spelling. Now, it doesn't matter that they were working out a word, spelling the word in speech sounds at a different code level. Say we're already using phonics and they're working at a different code level. Because what you do is you show them the word. So they've just spelt it with the spelling monsters, which means it doesn't matter about the phonics. So you show them the word gigantic. Every letter is used. Every speech sound is used. J. I. G. A, N, T, I, K. So in this case, it was very easy one-to-one -one code mapping. One speech sound, one letter. It doesn't always, doesn't usually work like that. J, I, G, A, N, T, I, K. We didn't have, for example, two or more letters representing a speech sound and what have you. We didn't have two letters together represent all sorts of different skills and concepts we pick up just by looking at how a word was code mapped, even if it's not at our code at our explicit code level. Now, you will always ask the child, have we learned something here? 
Well, they might say, well, look, there's two there. They might know the letter name is G, but they might say, look, I've got two Gs. Well, are they both pictures of the same speech sound? J, I, G. No. So we've learned something new. We might have learned the concept that a sound pick can represent more than one speech sound. So every time you're doing things, you're always asking, what have we learned? Now, you'll see it goes black, grey, black, grey. That's just to show the child, again, show their brain how the speech sounds, how we follow the speech sounds. This is what it looks like when we've code mapped it, but then we're doing it, how we would do it if we were writing it or if we were reading it in a book. So again, it shows the children, OK, this is what I look at in a book. If it's actually code mapped for me, it's going to look black, grey, black, grey. And that's why we show a lot of our readers, um, the SSP readers, we actually show them using the black, grey, black, grey. So the children can actually eat more easily identify where those speech sounds are. Another technique unique to SSP is called speedy pair decoding. We do it with speedy coded sentences as well as with readers. The d -o -g dog d -e -g stigs e -n in the, uh, the sand. sand. The dog digs in the sand. Here are some children using their duck hands and follow the sound, say the word, with a Thomas book that I wrote. Ot, the or, I, d, m, egg, z, a, m, o, o. Well done, keep going. Let's say it together. It is too cold to play football today, Thomas, said the speech sound frog. You should help us find Meg the mole. There's that J we looked at earlier on. Now the students can both be at different code levels. All that matters is that the child who is following the sounds can actually code this text. So she can read this text fairly fluently. Well, she can read this text fluently. So she's going to follow the sounds whilst the other child is pointing to the word. So they're looking at the word and they're going to blend it into the word. At the end of it, you say they read the sentence together. So the child who is following the sounds, that's really helping with their spelling. The child who is saying the words, that's helping them with their decoding, with their blending skills. We do a lot of collaborative learning with an SSP. The child who is pointing to the word is dictating the speed at which their partner codes it for them. So it's up to them if they want more time so they can really look at the word, they can hear their partner coding it for them, then they dictate that that's a slower pace. That was very slow, speedy decoding. That's why we call it speedy pair decoding. We normally do it a lot quicker than that. Normally it would be something like to open us the are to ank enger itten so ed to u ha is for end ka atm and ha av bur ek fast we is m e sp each sound for og and then they read it together see if you can do it use the black gray black gray i've coded it for you so you can see where each speech sound maps What's difficult for most adults is that they look at it and they look at the basic phonics instead of thinking of the speech sounds. Look at the word to. I find that some teachers, some parents, when they're first doing it, they might go to or because they're thinking of basic phonics. But that's not the word. The word is to. If you already, that's why it's important the person who's doing the following the sounds knows the words. You already know that's the word to. So you already know to say to oo. And that really helps the partner because the partner is looking at it and hearing to oo, blending into the word to. Think about me again. If somebody said m e, m e means nothing. It's me. So the speech sounds are m e, 
me. So you're thinking about the actual speech sounds. Forget phonics. Let your brain do the code mapping. You probably missed her little circular kind of movement just there. She just identified a split vowel digraph. We call it a blue level sound pick sandwich. But she just did it as she was reading it, which is fantastic. Milk. In, in, a, a, c up, cut, I must I get a one. I, I, what, ill, will, for x, fix, itch, gum, Do you do do it it a good atten again and and a good atten again and and a good atten again. Now what you might do then is say, okay, let's read the whole thing in a speaking voice. You, you do, do it, it again, again and again and again. They all become obsessed with code mapping because they can code map what they want to code map. They can read books like Minecraft, things they're really interested in. So the aim is a focus on reading for pleasure, writing for pleasure. We're making sure we cover all of the essential elements. But I want you to use the phonemic awareness really effectively, really understand it, really use it well. Because trust me, all of the rest of these all fall into place. If you get the phonemic awareness right, so it transitions into phonics really easily. And then we teach phonics systematically, but it's in the way that works for each child. So not just one specific way, for example, synthetically. And now I am off for a cuppa. <laughs>